This is the battleship Texas, the only surviving U.S. naval vessel to serve in both world wars. She saw action from the North Sea to the Pacific Ocean. Hello. I'm proud to be joining National Geographic in a tribute to those who served in the South Pacific, the men who fell in one of the fiercest battles of our time at Guadalcanal. You know, the day I turned 18, I went down and enlisted in the Navy, and I was still in pre-flight training when we heard about Guadalcanal. For six months, they fought over that tiny South Pacific island, and the losses were enormous. And yet it was one of the defining moments of World War II. I got to the Pacific about 14 months later, and by then the war had begun to turn our way. Still, as a pilot on the aircraft carrier San Jacinto, I can tell you there was plenty of tough fighting left. On September 2nd, 1944, our group was sent out to attack the Japanese radio towers on a little island called Chichijima, about 650 miles from Japan. In the middle of the bombing run, my plane was hit, we managed to drop our bombs and get away. But we had to bail out over the water. I was lucky enough to be rescued nearly three hours later by one of our submarines. My crew was less fortunate. Five decades have passed since World War II, and now veterans from both sides, Allied and Japanese, are returning to the South Pacific. They come to honor their fallen friends, and coming with them is Dr. Robert Ballard, the man who found the Titanic and the battleship Bismarck. And with the cooperation of the U.S. Navy, he will be searching for the great ships that went down in those terrible battles. Ballard's bringing state-of-the-art technology. The survivors, well, they're bringing their memories. And yet each comes to retell the same story, the story of the lost fleet of Guadalcanal. In the beginning, Guadalcanal was simply an obscure island in the southwest Pacific. By the end, it was known as the Island of Death. In 1942, a world war descended upon Guadalcanal. We didn't know what to expect. We didn't know what was coming, and what was going to follow. In six months of ferocious fighting, tens of thousands of men died. In this type of savagery, one reverts to an almost barbaric type of existence. And you do things under these conditions that nobody in their right mind or normally would do. Every man was wounded in spirit, haunted by what he'd seen and felt. I looked at him, he looked at me, and he, he gave me a smile. That was it. I am told this before. For fifty years, the Battle of Guadalcanal lived on only in memory. until Robert Ballard, the explorer who'd found the wrecks of the Titanic and the Bismarck, came to the vast graveyard of ships that waited, unseen and untouched, on the ocean floor. I've walked many battlefields on land. The guns are gone, the tanks are gone. But 
Here, the ships are still locked in combat, frozen in time. They're like ghost ships, with the guns still at the ready, as if they haven't finished the battle, as if it's still going on. In 1992, Bob Ballard brought the research vessel Laney Cho S to Guadalcanal in a joint expedition with the National Geographic Society and the U.S. Navy. Ballard hoped to explore several crucial ships lost in the battle. In the chaos of war, no one had recorded exactly where they went down. His mission? To reassemble the fractured pieces of the past. Ballard's destination was a remote volcanic island in the Solomon's chain of the South Pacific. His target area was the channel north of Guadalcanal, an area now called Iron Bottom Sound. There's no other place in the world like Iron Bottom Sound where, where so many ships sank in a single campaign. There's not just one ship down there that we're after, there are, are 50 ships. Going down there should be like, like visiting a huge underwater museum, giving us an opportunity to, uh, to visit a battlefield still waiting for us 50 years later. With Ballard were others hoping to make a connection to the past. Survivors returned to Guadalcanal for the 50th anniversary of the battle, bringing their memories of six months of war. I'm Stu Mordock. Good to meet you. What, to meet you. what ship? Uh, right there. Okay. We have veterans from both sides here, both American and Japanese. Fifty years ago, these guys were trying to kill each other. Today, they're here together. And what we're hoping to do is to reunite these survivors with their old ships. I left, uh, I left my sword on board the Atlanta. You think I can go down? I know exactly where it is. If it's only a couple <laughs> levels down, I think we can find it. To probe Iron Bottom Sound, the Navy had equipped Ballard with a costly but somewhat temperamental collection of high-tech tools. The Scorpio, a remote-controlled undersea vehicle capable of sending video images back to the surface. And the Seacliff a free-diving submarine with a three-man crew. Ballard would have just 18 days to explore and photograph the ships below, if all went well. We've got a lot riding on this expedition. The Navy's loaned us all this equipment and they're, they're expecting us to find ships. And veterans have come from all over the world to be here, so you know they're expecting to see their old ships. It's a lot of pressure. Probably the biggest challenge we've ever had. The war in the Pacific had begun in December 1941, when Japanese bombers raided the U.S. base at Pearl Harbor. The architect of the Japanese attack was a man who did not want to go to war. Admiral Isoroku Yamamoto, the commander of the Japanese fleet, understood American military power. He had begged his prime minister to avoid war. Instead, he was ordered to plan an attack. If I'm told to fight, I will run wild and win victory after victory. After that, I have no expectation of success. At first, Yamamoto did run wild. In a few short months, Japan swept quickly through the Pacific, and the Allies suffered a series of shocking humiliations. The British garrison at Singapore fell to a conquering Japanese force a third its size. In February, Japanese planes demolished a port in northern Australia. 
Bataan, 76,000 allies surrendered. Even Emperor Hirohito noted, the fruits of war are tumbling into our mouth almost too quickly. After eight months of war, the Japanese occupied 20 million square miles of territory, five times more than Nazi Germany. In America, the nation mobilized as quickly as it could. My friend Henry Brunkhorst and I decided we were going to join the Marine Corps because everybody knew they were the first to fight. They were right. In Somerville, Massachusetts, 18-year-old Harry Horsman left home and headed for a war 8,000 miles away. When we left in early June, my regiment went by train. As it turned out, it was a Pullman train which had dining cars on it. So we, we went off to war in a blaze of luxury. Most of us had never gone beyond our, our home state borders. I was a world traveler. I had been to Vermont, New Hampshire, though, from Massachusetts. Among the others heading west were Lieutenant Commander Jack Wintle and his wife, Mary Clyde. We had a wonderful marriage. I was madly in love with him, and I think he was with me. And um, I've often laughed. He was so handsome. And I've had people say, how did you get him? Well, I had him. Their courtship in the mid-30s had been a storybook romance, the handsome midshipman and the Southern Belle. Soon after Jack shipped out, Mary Clyde received the first in a long series of letters. Darling, I'll never forget the terrible letdown as I saw you pull away at San Francisco. It can only be erased by seeing you again and enjoying your loveliness by just being near you. You have all my love, now and forever. Jack. By the summer of 1942, scores of ships laden with thousands of Marines were steaming across the Pacific to stop the Japanese advance. Bert Doughty, from Oakland, California, was a gunner on a destroyer, the Monson. There's more friendship on a smaller ship there is than a bigger ship. You have a small crew, count the officers and men, and you get to know one another and you're real close. We were real buddies. We were young whole kids at that time. We had a lot of guts and we were ready to take on the whole damn world. Marine Harry Horsman was aboard a troop transport. Life on a transport is not a bed of roses. Uh, you're in each other's way all the time. It's crowded. Everybody initially gets dysentery. Somebody had a, a record player, but they only had one record apparently, and it was Cherry River Bean and the Carnival of Venice. And we heard this all the way across the Pacific, those two songs. The commander of the Marines was General Archer Vandegrift, a soft-spoken Virginian of equal parts determination and optimism. He would meet both. In July, intelligence radioed an urgent message. The Japanese were building an airstrip that threatened Australia. Soon, Vandegrift's task force, the first American offensive of the war, set out to take that airstrip. The target, an island called Guadalcanal. Nearly 50 years later, a very different expedition made Guadalcanal its target. Bob Ballard began his exploration of Iron Bottom Sound with a preliminary survey on a small ship called the Restless M. Okay. 
Now swing it out. Ballard's main tool was a sonar fish, a device that bounced sonar signals off the ocean bottom. With it, Ballard hoped to map the positions of many of the ships lost in Iron Bottom Sound. That's that notch. You'd think it would be easy to find ships in Iron Bottom Sound, but it's not. When the ships were sinking, no one took accurate positions. By nightfall, Atlanta rode to her anchor off Lunga Point. Right, right. But it was impossible to keep the ship afloat. The Japanese. What were was there. going through their minds? Well, yeah. then you read the logs, and they were getting blown up, and fires were burning, and it's it's really hard to try to figure out where they might have taken their ships because they're not where they said they were. So where did they go? Something big with debris all around it. Even the most modern sonar is a very inexact tool. From the vague echo images, it was tricky enough for Ballard to locate a sunken ship, much less tell its identity. Well, we'll do it again. We'll get it right. After weeks of frustration for Ballard and his crew, an unmistakable shape finally appeared on the sonar screen. Oh, wow. Not a great looking one. But no, but what an echo. Yeah, exactly. We got it. We got it. From there to there is the ship. Finally. <laughs> we got it. <laughs> what a slog. Gosh, it put up a battle. God, did it ever. It put up a heck of a battle. Now we got to get a good picture of it. By the end of the first expedition, Ballard had found only a few ships, and even their identities were uncertain. The next year, he would still have to search for most of his major targets. Before World War II, Guadalcanal was far removed from what was called civilization. The first wheel many Solomon Islanders ever saw came on the bottom of an airplane. Guadalcanal was an insignificant piece of the British Empire, a remnant of the era of English glory, run by the colonial service, which for decades had been attracting people like Martin Clemens. Clemens had studied at Cambridge. He was an aristocrat, but also an adventurer, before the war, Clemens applied for a job with the Colonial Service, where he would get more adventure than he ever dreamed. Halfway through the interview, they said, Oh, you like sailing, don't you? I said, yes. Well, how would you like to go to the Solomon Islands? I said, oh, rather, and rushed off home to find out where the places they were. But Clemens' days as a colonial administrator ended in mid-1942, when the Japanese landed on Guadalcanal. Clemens hastily organized a network of loyal scouts and moved into the hills. With only an office safe, a 300-pound teleradio, 190 carriers, and his three-volume Shakespeare. Soon, Clemens would set up his teleradio behind enemy lines. The young man from Cambridge was now a spy. I got used to sleeping very lightly and waking at the slightest sound. But the main feeling was that we were entirely alone. Clemens was isolated in the Guadalcanal jungle. He was one part of a network called the Coast Watchers, men who reported on enemy activities from hideouts in Japanese territory. They soon became the Allied eyes and ears in the Solomons. Soon after the Japanese arrived on Guadalcanal, that it was quite obvious they were going to do some building, and the only thing they could be building was an airfield. I had quite a large squad of scouts keeping a very detailed check on it, and every new hut they put up, we found out what was in it, or every new gun, we worked out what the position was. The 
Japanese knew Clemens was there. They hunted for him. For months, he lived on terror route and good luck. He walked in streams to avoid bloodhounds. Still, Clemens kept sending in reports, waiting impatiently for the Allies to take action. That's a lot went through one's brain, and so many sensations of fear and no help in sight. And I couldn't see any coming for a very long time. On August 6th, Japanese workers set up beacons along their nearly finished airstrip, then drank sake in celebration. Martin Clemens despaired. In his diary, he wrote, is nothing going to happen after all? The next morning, August 7th, 1942, Allied ships began shelling the beach at Guadalcanal. Neither side really wanted this island. To the Japanese, Guadalcanal was just another step south. But the Allies could not let them take it. And so Harry Horsman and 11,000 other Marines found themselves heading toward shore to fight a battle that had to be won on an island that didn't really matter. We were greatly relieved to find out that nobody was firing at us once we got a foot on shore. Where the hell was the enemy? The landing was a cakewalk. The Japanese construction units at the airstrip ran for the hills, leaving the Marines to unload their supplies at what seemed like peace. Thayer Sol was the Marine documentary filmmaker on Guadalcanal. We came in with the first wave, no opposition, of course. And then some officers said, here, you aren't doing anything. Put that camera down and come and help move these boxes. We came up here with the absolute irreducible minimum of supplies. We were desperately in need of food, ammunition, everything else. Fortunately, uh, the naval bombardment had done only superficial damage and scared the Japs out, but they left a whole great big uh, locker full of all kinds of canned goods, tons of rice, of course. And then also, I have to tell you about the the beer that we found, there were cases and cases of this stuff in one liter bottles. And the fellows tried it and they said it was terrible. And the language officer looked at it and he said, well, I'm not surprised, it's fly spray. <laughs> From his hideout in the hills, Martin Clements watched the Marines swarming over the beach. His months of starvation and fear were finally over. It took me an awful lot of thought to realize that I really had come down and I wasn't stuck in the bush forever. But we then had to face up to the problem of how we managed to contact the Americans. And uh, I said, well, there's only one thing to do, and that's to form up in two lines and we'll fly our Union Jack and we'll just march down the beach. One morning, a Marine sentry beheld an amazing sight. Two ranks of minimally clad islanders, rifles on shoulders, led by one starving white man in tattered clothing and one small dog. The sentry raised his rifle, but he didn't shoot. And I tried to say something to him, but nothing happened. My mouth wouldn't speak. Clemens was soon given the job of supplying the Marines with scouts. His days as a spy were over. The Marines occupied only a small fraction of the island, but it was the crucial fraction. They had the unfinished airstrip. Vandegrift wrote home, we have the place we set out to take. The fighting is now over. But the fighting was not over. It would last for six full months. At the Japanese base in Rabaul, 600 miles away, life was not greatly disturbed by the landing. 
Yamamoto expected to wipe the Marines off the island with one brush of the armored sleeve. He immediately ordered a decisive counterattack by both sea and air. Fighter pilot Saburo Sakai was part of the raid. One of Japan's leading aces, Sakai had already shot down 54 enemy planes. After nearly four hours, he reached the Allied landing force of 60 ships. We had never seen such a large enemy fleet. How magnificent, I thought. A swarm of American fighters zoomed off aircraft carriers to meet the threat. Sakai soon squared off with an enemy pilot. He and I got into a one-on-one -on -one dogfight. I aimed and shot at the Grumman from behind. Suddenly his plane slowed down. Engine damage. Then I saw something terrible. I saw for the first time a wounded opponent who was tormented by my efforts to kill him and the possibility of death. How sad, I thought. But then I thought, this is war. You've got to do this. So I dropped back behind him, aimed and squeezed off a burst of my 20 millimeter cannon. His canopy blew up. I prayed for this man whose face I had seen so clearly. Sakai next attacked a group of eight dive bombers. One I shot at went down. At the same instant, their bullets began jolting me. My canopy exploded with tremendous force. Got shot, I thought. Then I spun down. The inside of my head turned pure white. I thought, killed in action, killed in action, killed in action. I'd made others go through this many times, and now it was my turn. Sakai managed to gain control of his plane. Though horribly mutilated and drenched in his own blood, he flew for five more hours and landed at dusk back home in Rabaul. Even as Sakai's squadron limped home, a Japanese striking force was steaming south. The next 36 hours would bring one of the most humiliating defeats in American naval history. A defeat caused by a brilliant admiral, Gunichi Makawa, and an incredible chain of Allied blunders. The mistakes began early. An Australian search pilot sighted the Japanese fleet but no one received his report for eight hours. An American admiral took aircraft carriers away from the area. Another admiral assumed the Japanese would only attack by air. A third admiral sailed off to a meeting. While Makawa, still undetected, raced at flank speed for a night attack. Korato Yoshie had joined the Navy at 17. He now operated searchlights on Makawa's flagship, the Chokai. We were very nervous at dinner because we knew we'd be facing the enemy soon. I wasn't exactly scared, but the tension certainly took my appetite away. But I was division chief, and I didn't want to make the young sailors even more nervous. So I ate everything. The Allied commander had made the mistake of dividing his force into two groups to the east of nearby Savo Island. Undetected, Makawa crept closer and closer to the southern group, sliding by an American lookout ship at whispering distance. Everyone was in their battle positions. The only sound we could hear was the screws of the ship moving through the water. At 1.38 a.m., Makawa began firing torpedoes. At 
ships that still didn't know he was there. You could see red, yellow, and blue in the sky. Although it was right in the middle of the fighting, I thought, how beautiful. In four minutes, the Australian cruiser Canberra took 24 direct hits, igniting a tremendous bonfire amidships. Bert Warren was four levels below deck when smoke began to surge through the ship. Suddenly everything started to go down, the lights started to go down. We were losing revolutions from our engines and everything was going dead. Then we had to find our way out through a darkened ship. All you could think of was to get some fresh air. This became a thing of prime importance in the mind, is to be able to breathe. Not just to survive, but to breathe. Warren finally reached open air, only to find the deck strewn with the wounded and dead. In seven minutes, Makawa had devastated the cruisers of the southern group. He now turned toward the northern group, five miles away. Incredibly, the Japanese presence was still unknown. The captains and many crew members of all three American cruisers were literally asleep. Petty Officer Leonard Jocelyn was in his bunk aboard the USS Quincy. When general quarters sounded, I jumped out of my bed and into my clothes and up the lighters I went to the signal bridge. And then a row of shells went right by, right across the bow of our ship. Then a row of shells up to the stern of our ship. We could see them coming. And they were, they were just like red lanterns coming right straight at us. And we, it was coming, it seemed to me like it was coming right straight at me. The Quincy somehow managed to return fire on the Chokai. But soon the Japanese bombardment became overwhelming. I says, everybody down. And when it was laying down, uh, the, uh, one of the officers came out of the pilot house on the other side of the ship and he came out they said, let's be men, not mice. Well, I thought how I'd like to be a mouse. And <laughs> he no more said it when he got hit with a shell. All three cruisers in the northern group were soon reduced to flaming ruins. Makawa now controlled the sea. Close by were 22 defenseless American transports, still half-loaded with food and ammunition desperately needed by the Marines on Guadalcanal. Thayer Soul was on one of the transports. You could hear the thunder rolling across from the gunfire. And then it was quiet, it was dark, and one plane up above us, and they dropped a flare, and all the transports were silhouetted against that light. And we knew the Japanese ships must be over there. And Captain Perkins said, well, this is it. Nice to know you fellows, the shells are on the way. But no shells were on the way. Makawa could have ended the entire campaign by destroying the transports, but he failed to finish the job. Convinced his victory was complete, he headed home. On this night of Allied blunders, the final mistake belonged to the Japanese. All the same, the Battle of Savo Island was one of the most crushing losses in the history of the U.S. Navy. In less than 40 minutes, Makawa sank four of the five Allied cruisers, damaged the fifth, and killed over a thousand Allied sailors.
Fifty years after the Battle of Savo Island, Bob Ballard returned to the site of the Allied disaster. He began his main expedition to Iron Bottom Sound with the research ship Laney Choest. After two days of sonar search, he located an object the size of an American cruiser. By mid-afternoon, both underwater vessels were ready to go. Ballard and his two-man crew went first in the Navy submarine Seacliff. Control C cliff. My vents are open. My vents are open. The crew lowered the robotic vehicle Scorpio 20 minutes after the sea cliff submerged. The Scorpio would provide the light needed for the sea cliff to film in the deep sea. Its cameras sent video images back up to the Laney Choes, where operators controlled the movement of the robotic vessel with a joystick. Good so far. Altitude uh, 370, and rate is 63. When you dive, you're heading into the unknown. So what are you going to find there? What's it going to look like? Ballard was searching for the Quincy, the first ship lost in Iron Bottom Sound. You can sense it when you get close. You follow a trail of debris that leads you right to the ship. Ballard had found his ship. The wreck was without doubt the Quincy. Right, we're coming in on the uh, back of the bridge. Now, if we can just drop down a little, Scorpio's in a good position, so you can see its lights shining in. See the hole just above the bridge? See that hole up there? They took a lot of shots right into the bridge. One, two, three, four, five shots. Wow. I don't see how anyone survived in there. Whenever you dive on a ship for the first time, you, you start to wonder who was aboard. It becomes very special, it becomes very lifelike, and you have these encounters. There were people, young people. So many of the people who died here were just kids. And you think about that. Three hundred and eighty-nine men died on the Quincy. One of the survivors was Leonard Jocelyn. Years later, 
I'd have nightmares and dreams at night. And I would see the ship coming into port. I'd see the men waving. I could, I could see the signal bridge. I knew that I was supposed to be up there. But the ship would fade away. And I'd try to catch it at another port. And the same thing. I could see the men waving, the signal bridge. I knew that I was supposed to be up there. But the ship would leave me. And the, then the dream would fade. But many times, years later even, I would dream of this ship and the men. And they're waving at me. On the Solomon Islands, even the first week of war shattered the old colonial picture of the world. Tom Tatulu had grown up on Guadalcanal and been educated by the British. We were taught by the missionaries that the British Empire is the greatest and the most strongest uh, empire after the, the Roman Empire. And then the war broke out with Japan and we are told that uh, uh, not to be scared of the Japanese uh, because the little yellow man is no match to the, uh, the British Navy and uh, the Allied forces. Tom Tatulu, like many Solomon Islanders, worked with the Allies. Tatulu was a porter. When all this uh, modern equipment and the transport arrived, it's so amazing that we just can't understand it. And it really um, affects our lives, you see. A change overnight. The Solomon Islanders assisted in what was now the Americans' critical task, finishing the airstrip. The Battle of Savo Island had crippled the Navy. So the Marines were totally vulnerable to attack by air and sea. The airstrip was still a muddy morass of ruts and bumps, but it was the Marines' only hope for defending themselves. Before the war, Arbel Jones had worked at Universal Studios. He now found himself a long way from Hollywood. We arrived at Henderson Field uh, to set up the airfield and get it operational. We were totally unprotected there. Until we got planes of our own in the, in the air, they, uh, the Japanese planes could just waltz in and attack us anytime they felt like it. That was very scary. On August 20th, the Americans again spotted planes flying low over the airfield. We thought it was another of those bombings that we've been having and strafing attacks. And uh, we look up and here is the ocean blue airplanes of the United States of America. And we started to holler, they're ours, they're ours. The Americans were not the only ones who valued the airstrip. After crushing the Allied Navy at Savo Island, the Japanese now set out to take back Guadalcanal. 900 crack soldiers landed just east of the airfield. A young sergeant from Hokkaido, Sadanobu Okada, was one of those soldiers. The idea of the United States forces taking away the airfield that Japan had built, that was really humiliating. The leader of the Japanese force was Colonel Kiyoano Ichiki. Ichiki was a tough and tested commander. He was also supremely confident. But he had reason to be confident. Japanese soldiers had overwhelmed the Allies in every previous battle. I think the Ichiki unit was the most elite unit in the entire Japanese army. We 
the initiated into battle. You might say we were like Hollywood High School. We were going up against the Los Angeles Raiders. On August 20th, Harry Horsman and the other Marines dug in on the bank of a sluggish river they called the Teneru. The Marines didn't have long to wait. The Cheeky did not scout American positions, and he did not try to avoid them. We just naturally assumed that we could break the enemy line if we charged in a night assault. The Japanese uh, made their initial charge with this wild screaming. It was, it was eerie. I was hit in the mouth by a shotgun. I heard a faint sound, like a click. Then I felt a bullet. My jawbone was tough enough to block the bullet, but then I had to dig it out with my fingers. When the first casualty that I had experience with was a chap by the name of Rogers, and when he was shot, his, uh, his brain and his blood uh, spat it all over another fellow and myself. There was sort of a little bit to the rear of him. Uh, and I think now the only thing that I can remember was that Jesus Rogers got it. Ichiki sent waves of attackers crashing against the American lines, using bayonets against machine guns. Tactics which had always served the Japanese well. When daylight came, uh, the sight before us was almost unbelievable. There were hundreds of mangled bodies over there. Uh, and uh, we took, I suppose, great satisfaction in our work. Ichiki's elite detachment had been annihilated. Ichiki hurried back to camp in shame. He tore his regiment's flag to tatters, burned the scraps, and committed harakiri. Of course, I'd never seen enemy dead before. Most of the people there had, and um, it, it was a shattering experience. And I remember thinking at the time how fortunate we were that we weren't there lying dead. We took very, very, very few prisoners. Uh, several of those who were tried to be taken prisoner uh, killed themselves right there on the spot. Some took uh, shots at the Rescuers, if you want to call us rescuers, at that time. I think our immediate reaction was that we realized that this was going to be a different kind of war. This was to be a war of savagery. It set the tone for the rest of the war in the Pacific. By day six of the expedition, Ballard had found five ships. Survivor Bert Warren joined the crew as the robotic vehicle Scorpio approached his old ship, the Canberra. It's really something to see the look on the face of a veteran when he finally sees his ship again. It's, it's like a window into time. The first time I saw Canberra was from Botanical Gardens in Sydney. She was white. She looked the white lady. She just looked beautiful. And because she was named Canberra, after our capital city, the people of Australia said, well, that represents Australia. They had a particular affection for the ship. And not only that, they had a good bunch of sailors on board. And when they got ashore, they didn't create a great deal of trouble.
Don't lose vigil. Get off about 10 feet. Would you like to try your hand at the stick? Oh. I'm going to let you sit in the chair if you want to try. Uh, I think you might have a steadier hand than me. Well, I trust this fellow to do it. Well, he'll be right next to you. All we'll right. give well, it a try. Okay, well, I'll get down there and we'll try that. Why don't you move in this side? So this part right here brings Take you care. up and down. Okay, right. we'll push it down. The vehicle goes down. Push it up. The vehicle oh, goes we'll push up. It. Like a toggle switch. Exactly. Well, this is where I spent the last of my time down in this area, you see. Thought I could get up closer to the gun turret. Okay. So I'm pretty well right over the edge of the, uh, edge of the deck here, aren't I? Okay, go ahead and pull back. I think we're a little bit high. So we are. Pull back again a little bit more. Watching the the ship through the screens of what it looks like now I kept getting flashes back the men that we had to leave down there that we couldn't get off they were too badly smashed about to move and of course my thoughts were for those too and I wondered uh, just what does happen to them when they're down there today some mixed thoughts when I saw Canberra. Now to say it, she looked pretty nice with a blue background and green weed and little white and yellow groups of coral. She, she looked as though uh, she was a nice lady with a couple of bouquets stuck around her. And uh, I reckon that was pretty good. In September 1942, Jack Wintle's letters from the South Pacific began to reach Mary Clyde and their children back home in Louisiana. I was lonely when he went away. Naturally, I was for him. And we didn't know how long it was going to be. Mary Clyde Wintle and her daughter Jackie came to Guadalcanal on the 50th anniversary of the campaign. Wish I could see you, Jackie, and Judy for a little while. The girls must be growing a good deal. One thing that has impressed me so terribly much is... One that thing that has impressed me so terribly much is the extremely small value of material things compared with the greater things, such as a chance to live, Your picture almost speaks to me. The only difficulty is that you're so far away that I can't touch you. I reach for you a thousand times a day. Why are we tortured so? For the Americans on Guadalcanal, loneliness was the least of their problems. Victory at Teneru River did not feed the Marines. The lack of supplies soon became agonizing. The rations were short. Supplies were short. Everything was short, except the rain, except the bugs, except the malaria that made its appearance, dysentery. You were fighting these elements as well as the enemy. It was a total hellhole. We lived in squalor, absolute squalor. We slept in our little pup tents, floorless pup tents, on our back, in the mud. Breakfast was thin gruel, and the other meal was rice. Socks and underwear were distant memories. The malaria caseload numbered in the thousands. The sick, hungry, exhausted Marines seemed to be sliding toward their ruin. General Vandegrift wrote, day by day, I watched my Marines deteriorate in the flesh.
One night, some of the first broadcasts of Tokyo Rose came on the radio, and she played the latest beautiful music of Glenn Miller and Tommy Dorsey. Hello, you fighting orphans of the Pacific. This is all request night. And I've got a She'd say, don't you wish you were in the arms of your lover in Griffith Park tonight? She'd say sweet things to us, you know, and then she'd get very dramatic, and she'd say, you Marines, you fifth Marines on the Mentanaka'u, we know right where you are, and tomorrow you will be dead. For the Marines, surrounded on their small corner of the island, there was nothing to do but wait for the day when the enemy would come. We didn't know what to expect. We didn't know what was coming, and what was going to follow. As summer turned into fall, the Japanese began loading ships for an overwhelming new offensive. After the shock at Teneru, the first defeat for the Japanese army, Yamamoto realized that this remote jungle island was of immense importance. Night after night, he shipped massive reinforcements to Guadalcanal for what he hoped would be the decisive battle in the Pacific War. Even as the Japanese massed on the island, General Vandegrift received a message from his commanding officer. It said, the Navy, fearful of losing more ships, could no longer support the Marines on Guadalcanal. The Marines were on their own. And a handwritten note accompanied the official one. If worst came to worst, Vandegrift was authorized to surrender. In his first 10 days at Guadalcanal, Ballard had filmed several of the lost ships he was after. With a week left to go, he began to search for the powerful battleship Karishima, the largest ship in Iron Bottom Sound. Karishima is the ship we want the most, but it's going to be tough. All we have to go on is where the Japanese Admiral said it went down, but We've been in Guadalcanal for weeks now, and none of the ships have been in the Admiral's positions. We're getting close to the Admiral's position. Well, there's nothing okay. there. Nothing. Mud. Lots of mud. Searching for ships with sonar is a very frustrating business. It can fool you. You can go by a rock formation, a geologic feature, and think it's a ship when it really isn't. More geology. More geology. More geology. Yeah, we got something. Probably more geology. Something. That's it. Well, but it's got to be Look a at it. big it's something. Going. Look at that. What's its okay, length? Thanks. 150 That's meters. It. Bigger than a it's destroyer. Still going, man. It's, it's big. 170 meters. 170 meters. 170 meters. That's it. All right. Hey, we got it. Right, we tell, got it. Go uh, tell right. people we got it. We got it. Yeah, we got, we got it. it. Look at it. Oh, my God. Come on, let's dive on it. The Ballard delation was short lived. The battery of the submarine Sea Cliff failed to take a charge. At the same time, the power supply of the robotic vessel Scorpio burned itself out. The expedition had suddenly hit the wall. This is the worst part of the expedition. We have 14 ships identified and uh, the submarine's broken. The Scorpio's also broken, so we can't get any of our assets down and we've got less than a week to go. Shot. You don't have another one? No, we don't have any spares on board. No, let's take a look at it. God, that's cremated. 
we got some of this back at home. Yeah, we've got a spare back in the other vehicle that we can uh, cannibalize and bring that out here, but it could be anywhere from one to three days before we get a flight in. Forget it. Okay, this is serious stuff. Okay, we just find the battleship and now we can't film it. Right. It's never easy and there's always a problem. The part is on another submarine out at sea right now that has to come into San Diego, drop the batteries out of that submarine, steal the parts, jump on an airplane, fly halfway around the world to get the parts here. It's, it's maddening. Fifty years earlier, the Marines on Guadalcanal faced impending disaster. They controlled only a shallow arc of land on a large island. The Japanese ruled the sea, cutting off Allied supplies. But the Americans had one trump card, the pockmarked, rutted track called Henderson Field. Whoever held Henderson Field held the key to victory. The airfield was called an unsinkable aircraft carrier until the night that Admiral Yamamoto's battleships tried to sink it. On the island uh, on October 12th was my birthday. I had now reached the advanced age, through a lot of good luck, to be 19 years old. And uh, lo and behold, about 1 a.m. on the 13th, there's tremendous blasts all of a sudden occur, seemingly to us out of nowhere. Boom, boom, boom. And a big flash of light rose up out of the uh, iron bottom sound against those low hanging clouds, and a staccato pounded against those things. And this went on louder, like, like freight trains whizzing over your head. And I thought, Jesus, I'll never live to see my 19th year. Hell of a time. I only have one day at being 19. General Vandegrift wrote, Until someone has experienced shelling, he cannot easily grasp the sensation of helplessness, fear, and shock. A man comes close to himself at such times. The next morning, the Marines crawled out of their foxholes to find Henderson Field a wreck. Their radio station destroyed, most of their plane fuel blown up. A hit on a ration dump had spangled the landscape with shards of spam. Most of the American planes were either damaged or destroyed. They fired 973 14-inch shells at us that night and they tore that airfield up, they tore our airplanes up, they tore everything up. With American planes disabled, the Japanese were free to land troops for a new offensive. The next day, the Marines woke to a humiliating spectacle. A huge task force calmly unloading soldiers in plain view of the Americans. The Japanese are landing men, equipment, artillery, of which we could do nothing about. We were powerless at this point. And we were given gunny sacks, which we were told had the last of the rations you're going to be issued and the last of the ammunition. It wasn't too good a uh, future at that point. The Japanese army soon launched its offensive, sideways. Their plan was complex, to march all the way around the Marines and attack from behind. On October 16th, the Sendai Division began their march. They ended up chopping trails through a trackless jungle, completely losing some units and exhausting the rest. After three days, they sharpened bayonets, expecting to fight the next morning. 
but couldn't find the enemy for five more days. Finally, on October 24th, at least some of the Japanese force attacked the ridge just south of Henderson Field. The Japanese outnumbered the Marines by three to one. But they charged straight at fortified positions. These dubious tactics seemed to work. After days of furious fighting, the Japanese took the crest of a ridge west of the airfield. On October 25th, they radioed Banzai, right wing captured airfield. The report was premature. Marine artillery blasted the Japanese off the ridge. The Americans surged forward and the battle was over. 2,200 Japanese lost their lives. American deaths numbered just 84. For the Japanese army, the aftermath of the battle for Henderson Field was as bad as the bloodbath itself. The Sendai Division had to retreat the way it had come, through 30 miles of swamp and jungle. This time, it would be without food. One officer wrote in his diary, October 27th. We haven't eaten for three days. I have to rest every two meters. October 29th. I don't know how many men must be left behind today. The soldiers abandoned their equipment. They started to eat leaves, bark, roots. The entire Japanese force was starving. They began to call Guadalcanal the island of death. I wonder how long this will last. It makes me feel like a little bird in the rain. Artillery officer Akio Tani was one of those starving on Guadalcanal. Very often, we would smell the delicious scent of the food cooking at the American base there when the wind wafted our way. I received a packet of black tea just one time. I didn't drink the tea. Drinking it would have been wasteful. I ate it. As the Japanese soldiers retreated, starving and defenseless, many were taken prisoner. Most of the Japanese army soldiers were in very bad shape. Instead of fighting, they are looking for food. And so uh, when we captured them, uh, they were very grateful that we were feeding them and at the POW compound. Roy Wihata, a second generation Japanese American, was assigned to military intelligence. Over 20 years before, his parents left Japan with a dream. They came to America to find a better life. After Pearl Harbor, they lost their farm. They lost everything but an album of photos. Roy's family was sent to an internment camp in Arizona, while Roy was in Guadalcanal fighting for his country. I thought that I was doing the correct thing at all times, and there was no hesitation on my part to even fire at any Japanese uh, soldier if they were on the other side of the front line. On Guadalcanal, we had to volunteer to interrogate Japanese prisoners. The Japanese commanders never expected their soldiers to surrender. They hadn't even told their soldiers not to talk. So it was very easy to get information from the prisoners. The uh, early prisoners were bleeding in their mouth 
And I asked him, why, uh, how come you uh, have uh, injuries around your mouth? He said, the, the uh, Marines used to uh, use their rifle butt to take out all these gold teeth that they were had in their mouth. So this is how I found out they were treated poorly by some of the Marine soldiers. We took some prisoners and a guard was placed on them in the middle of the night he shot them. Why? He got tired of standing watch, so he shot them. We knew that they didn't try to escape, they couldn't. So and in this type of savagery, one reverts to an almost barbaric, everyday type of existence. And you do things under these conditions that nobody in their right mind or normally would do. They probably, and us, but we did them. The island of quiet villages, after only a few months of war, had become almost unrecognizable to Tom Tutulu and the other Solomon Islanders. When we went to war with the Allies, as a porter, or as a spy, or as a scout, uh, we just don't understand uh, what it's all about. Uh, this an American war, it's a Japanese war maybe, but it's not a uh, Solomon Island war, you see. But as they landed on our shores, uh, then we're caught in it. And of course, we, we think that we're helping the Allies without realizing what it's all about. After nearly a week of waiting, and with only four days left in Guadalcanal, the expedition's submarines were finally functional. Ballard prepared to dive just before dawn. Service control, this is Seacliff uh, Delta 2. Decimal five, over. As we dive, we, we try to occupy ourselves with our equipment. Checking our sensors. Four, five, six, descent radius, 50 Making seven. sure we're on course. No target on the sonar. But what you're really thinking about is what we're going to see when we finally get down there. But as Seacliff neared the ocean bottom, Ballard suddenly noticed something very disturbing on his carbon dioxide indicator. CO2 is going up. Yep, it's going up. As the CO2 level rose, oxygen was disappearing. Breathing would soon become impossible. Seacliff control. CO2. The Seacliff was 3,000 feet deep. The ascent back to the surface would take over an hour. A backup meter confirmed the danger. Control C cliff. CO2 continues to rise. Request permission to terminate. Over. Fighting panic the men were soon forced to use an emergency oxygen supply. Control C cliff, donning EBS, over. Control C cliff. Pose 
Departed from face shield. Expedite. With one oxygen mask out of commission, the three divers had to share two masks. With agonizing slowness, the sea cliff rose toward the surface. We came here to document the war, to document the insanity that took so many lives. But the last thing I expected was to join the men who died in Iron Bottom Sound. I'm glad we survived this one. Interesting dive. In November 1942, the majestic battleship Kirishima led a powerful fleet of 61 ships toward Guadalcanal. With the fleet went the Empire's final hopes to recapture the island. Their plan called for the fleet to bombard Henderson Field. Eleven troop transports would then land 7,000 fresh soldiers on the island. Japanese command wrote, the coming naval battle is the fork in the road which leads to victory, for them or for us. Mishiharu Shinya from Tokyo had enlisted only because every young man in Japan had to. Stuart Mordock from Indiana had dreamed of the Navy and the imaginary event called war. These two young men, worlds apart, were about to meet in combat. We knew the Japanese were going to strike that night. The intelligence reports were just so definite. I can remember from the island came uh, the fragrance of flowers, the tropical flowers. And I didn't feel like, you know, going into battle. An innovation called radar gave the Allies the advantage of surprise, in theory. But the American commander did not trust the newfangled instrument. He knew where the Japanese ships were, but he didn't fire. He didn't fire for eight long minutes. Ships that could hit targets 12 miles away came within five miles, then two miles, then one and then less. Suddenly, I could see a line of American cruisers directly in front of us. And so we snapped on our searchlights. Bingo came a searchlight right on the Atlanta. I could still see that light uh, off the port bow burning a hole right through me. It was just amazing. At that point, I saw the forward guns of the Atlanta swing out so rapidly and fire. In minutes, 13 American and 14 Japanese ships were all firing, almost at random. One of the men doing the firing was Bert Dowdy on the Monson. We were really shooting at anything that moved. I believe we hit our ships, our own ships. Japanese done the same. We hit the Japanese, they hit us. It was just one hell of a brawl. The two formations dissolved into chaos. Opposing ships came so close that sailors shot at each other with machine guns. Mordock's Atlanta was smashed by two full battery salvos from another American ship. Every man on the bridge, including Mordock, was hit. 
I saw Admiral Scott coming toward me, and I, I, I saw him take his, uh, his last step, boop, and that was it uh, for him. He, he was killed right there. Shinya's Akatsuki attracted an avalanche of fire from five enemy ships, including the crippled Atlanta. Every part of the ship became unstable. It started to quiver and shake. And then the ship began to sink, and we all had to jump into the sea. On Bert Doughty's Monson, the captain thought he was being fired on by friendly ships. He switched on recognition lights, and the destroyer was immediately struck by 37 shells. It was just one hell of a bang, and that was it. I got hit, and I just went out. I lay there unconscious all night long. I didn't get off the ship. Only a few miles away, Stuart Mordock was trapped on the bridge of the Atlanta. Shells kept exploding all around him. Mordock, in panic, vaulted over the bridge rail, a 20-foot drop to the deck. Down I went. And I hit, uh, I'm pretty certain, a, a bunch of dead bodies that, that, on that gun emplacement because I, I heard the noise of their, you know, their lungs, their, their whatever, if it's a... Uh, shattering kind of feeling right at that moment that I'd done that. At dawn, seven damaged ships still drifted, burning and smoking on the glassy surface of Iron Bottom Sound. One of them was the Monson, where Bert Doughty was still unconscious. Pieces of shrapnel lodged in his skull, and his ship sinking beneath him. His help came in the end from sharks. Three of Doughty's friends made it off the ship, but the sharks were so terrifying, they finally paddled back to the sinking destroyer. They happened to see somebody move. It was me. And they said, well, for crying out, it's Buddy Burke. He called me Buddy Bird. And I was alive. While Doughty's buddies got him off the ship, Japanese survivors floated on the surface of Iron Bottom Sound. One of them was Mishiharu Shinya. Many hours passed, and the sea and sky gradually became light. Looking toward the east, I saw a small American boat coming slowly toward me. They tried to rescue me, but I blurted out in English, no thanks. Still, you're not really free when you're treading water in the ocean, so eventually I gave up. For us, being captured was extremely shameful, much worse than dying. By afternoon, boats ferried the wounded Americans, including Stuart Mordock, to land. I remember being with the others there, and there was one seaman on a stretcher right by me. Very seriously, what did you can tell? And uh, I looked at him, he looked at me, and he, he gave me a smile. That was it. I haven't told this before. And I'll, I'll always remember that Both sides, the battle was incredibly costly. 
The Americans lost two cruisers, seven destroyers, and over 1,700 men. The Imperial Navy, two battleships, one cruiser, three destroyers, and nearly 1,900 men. A standoff. But the next day, that standoff turned into a decisive American victory. Bombers sank seven Japanese troop transports, ending the Japanese attempt to reinforce, ending Japanese hopes to retake the island ending any true possibility of the Japanese holding the South Pacific. Fifty years after the decisive battle, men who had fought each other met again on the Laney Choest. Were you the first Japanese ship to open searchlights? Yes, I think so, I think so. I think it was on us. <laughs> I think. If you were the first. So you but uh, I think uh, we are hit by uh -huh. some uh, cruiser. Uh, the first searchlight that came from the Japanese was on the Atlanta. So we immediately swung our turrets off to the port left. and started firing and I'm sure other ships did the same thing. Bam. Boom in. With three days to go in the expedition, Ballard's crew lowered the Scorpio. The two veterans watched from the Laney Choest, hoping for the chance to get a glimpse of their old ships. Boom into the attached float position. Boom in. Oh, there it goes, huh? There it is. There it is. There it is. Well, that was startling, wasn't it? Well, that just comes right on. There's your ship. Boom. There, look at the look at the damage. Boy, that torpedo. Yeah. That damn thing set the ship just right up. It's so ragged. It's so ragged and spread out. Do you recognize anything? Or back up, back up and up a little. Back up and up a little. 12 feet. So that's far enough back. Keep it in view. Boy. And just come up and want to get a bow back at us. Nope, afraid not. It's pretty messed up. Keep yeah. going back in. <laughs> the ship floated on the spot where the two men had fought, reviving their memories of war. In a war, uh, you don't think personal. You think there's something out there, and you don't care what it is, and you just shoot, and you, you don't think about what's happening, do you? Yeah. Ballard and Shinya reviewed video images of a destroyer they hoped was Shinya's Atkatsuki. But identification proved to be a bewildering puzzle. The destroyers Atkatsuki and Ayanami were virtually identical. So this is on the stern. And both ships had been sunk in the same battle. One of the few distinguishing features had been the name of the ship painted on the hull. That's a Ah, you Yeah, ah. That's an A? The only remaining Japanese character was the first one, and both Atkatsuki and Ayanami began with the same character. But both ships had the same? That's right. Both ships had the same letter. For Ballard and Shinya, the identity of the wreck would remain a frustrating riddle. 
I've come to think that the spectacle of human beings killing each other is without equal. The devil in us makes us enjoy watching it, but no one can make us enjoy having it done to us. I kept saying I was on borrowed time. Really, it's uh, a feeling uh, that I have a legacy. I just have a feeling, am I a worthy survivor? How can I live my life so that it's worthy of what happened? In the days after the November naval battle, the American fleet limped south for repairs. Mary Clyde Wendell began to hope that her husband Jack would soon get shore leave in San Francisco. Darling, the day will soon be here when I'll be able to come back home for quite a spell. By mid-November, Mary Clyde was waiting expectantly for news. When that Western Union fella came up on the doorstep, I thought it was my cue to come to San Francisco. And when I got the to went to the door, the man said, "Lady, this is a death message." We regret to inform you that your husband, Lieutenant Commander Jack Will was killed in action and buried at sea. I thought that he would be untouchable. He was, he was good, that nothing would happen to him. But, you know, you mature, you grow, you grow up. You realize that life's not that way. Weeks after his death, Jack's letters kept coming. Darling, the moon has been beautiful of late. Hope you've seen it. I've looked at it and longed for you. Think of you all day and until I fall asleep, then I dream of you. Wish I could call you on the telephone tonight just to tell you how much I love you. Mary Clyde Wendell never remarried. Sea cliff uh, control on the bottom, depth 3055. Can you give us a range and bearing to the target? Over. Only 36 hours before the end of the expedition, Bob Ballard tried one last time to explore the Kirijima. One more degree as we drive forward. Finally, he was within yards of the elusive battleship. In the days when it was just built, the Kirishima was the pride and joy of the Japanese fleet. And for 20 years, when people thought of the Imperial Navy, it's her they thought of. Now, she's come to this. Oh my God, look at that. This one's upside down. 800 feet of upside down battleship. Amazing. I've never seen a ship in, in the deep sea upside down. They always write themselves. Bismarck righted itself. Titanic righted itself. Normally they roll back coming on the way down. But this one didn't roll. It must have been that, that superstructure, you know, it could have acted like a keel. Oh wow, look at that. It's coming right in by the window. Back off. 
boy, look at the size of that propeller. 15, 20 feet across. Oh, watch out, we're getting a little too close. Now look at, is it coming in your window? It looks like we're just about to brush against it. Wow, look at the size of those propellers. Unbelievable. Hiroshima was the last Japanese ship to sink in the November naval battle. And when she went down, the hopes of an entire country went down with her. After four months of fighting, the Americans had a stranglehold on the island. The Marines turned over their hard-won territory to the army. The Marines bore little resemblance to the fresh young men who had waded ashore. Their uniforms were in tatters, the men themselves sick, exhausted, worn out. The shock of that leaving Guadalcanal numbed us, and there was no jumping or joy, and nobody with any hilarity. I couldn't believe that reaction when I looked back on it, and we just shuffled to load into the Higgins boat and leave this place. As bad as conditions were for the Americans, they were worse for the Japanese. Without food or reinforcements, the remaining soldiers seemed doomed to die on the island. But on three February nights, the Japanese Navy slipped through the curtain of Allied surveillance to steal 11,000 troops away from their fate. The last act of the campaign, like so much before it, was a mix of courage, blunder, and simple luck. When we were pulling out from Guadalcanal, we left a soldier there who was still breathing. I will never forget that. The image of that young soldier just being left there, unconscious but still breathing, that keeps coming back to my mind, even today. For the Marines, after months on the front lines, the next stop was Melbourne. The Australians, Marines agreed, were suitably grateful. You know, the people of Australia were marvelous. Marvelous. Everybody had an adopted family, it seemed, and certainly had girlfriends. Melbourne was the piece of cake, particularly the parade in front of all those Aussies like that. People are shouting, God bless you, Yank, you saved Australia. Old ladies would come around, hug you about the neck. Old soldiers from World War I would shake your hand. It brought it all home that what we had done was not in vain. And it was appreciated. In a few months, the name Guadalcanal had gone from obscurity to legend. The campaign turned the war around in a literal sense. Before Guadalcanal, the Japanese always advanced. After Guadalcanal, they were always in retreat. The road now led only one way, toward Japan. On August 15, 1945, Emperor Hirohito broadcast news of Japan's surrender. Japanese soldiers returned home to desolation and even shame. After the war, we were supposed to stop wearing the military uniform but we had no other clothes, so we just ripped off the insignia and kept wearing the uniform. As long as I was wearing it, I still felt I was a soldier. But there was nothing much to do there. 
I spent every day in an absent-minded state. From August when the war ended until February, I didn't do any work, I just stayed at home. For many, the war gradually became a forgotten part of the past. But for Sadanobu Okada, who had faced Harry Horsman at the Battle of Tenaru River, there could be no forgetting. Over the years, the two enemies had begun to exchange letters. The letters eventually numbered in the hundreds. And in 1992, they finally met in Tokyo. A very strange offshoot of the Battle of Guadalcanal seemed to forge in later years a rapport between Americans and Japanese. This picture, oh. Ilu Tenero. Yes. And this is with soldiers on the field who faced each other, suffered the same conditions. They worse than us, of course. While we were hungry, they starved. I was 21 years old. I was 18. Horsman had brought relics taken from dead Japanese soldiers on Guadalcanal. He hoped that Okada would be able to recognize signatures from the doomed Ichiki detachment, and the memorabilia could be returned to the families of the dead. Well, I hope that uh, this one will end up with a family, if they can be found. Over the years, Horsman's letters to Okada had helped Japanese survivors and relatives locate the burial sites of soldiers killed on Guadalcanal. The Japanese came to perform a Buddhist rite over the remains of the dead. Without the ceremony, the spirits of the dead would be forced to roam over the earth forever. On the 50th anniversary of the campaign, the now independent nation of the Solomon Islands honored the men who had served in the war. One of those men was Tom Tatula. The very moment I'm, wait I'm waiting for has now arrived. I received a Solomon Island medal. Another honored guest at the ceremony was former Coast Watcher Martin Clemens, reunited with his scouts. How are you? Long time now. Long time. Long time. Long time. For better, or worse, the Second World War brought the Solomon Islanders into the civilized world. Okay, they're coming in. Hold this position. They're coming in on the bow. 
In his Guadalcanal expedition, Bob Ballard had located 14 ships and filmed 12 of them. Thirty-six more vessels still wait for discovery. At journey's end, Ballard laid down a plaque to honor those who died in Iron Bottom Sound. It's a little strange putting a plaque thousands of feet deep in the ocean. Who's going to see it after all? Maybe this is the right place for it because this is their gravesite. This is where they died. This is where they'll always be. tacticians of the world were to leave it to survivors you wouldn't have any wars you wouldn't have any I just have a feeling Papa knows we're here Sitting here, and I look out there, I can just picture those fellows out there. And as I'm telling my story here, they're just saying to me, I know they are. Tell it like it is, Bert. Really tell it like it is. So I'm trying my best, fellas. That's why I came back here, just to pay my respects to you fellows out there. You'll always be with me, you're in my mind. Think of the good times we had. I salute you. That's the way it is. I don't know what else I can tell you.
We hope you have enjoyed this presentation from the National Geographic Video Library. April 1912, the greatest maritime disaster in North Atlantic history. RMS Titanic was the ship they called unsinkable. It was a luxurious floating palace, the largest ship of her time, doomed from the moment her maiden voyage began. 74 years later, the Titanic's resting place is uncovered, and explorer Dr. Robert Ballard dives deep into the disaster that shook the world. National Geographic journeys through tragic corridors beneath the sea to uncover the secrets of the Titanic. In 1986, Dr. Robert Ballard led the team that explored the wreck of the Titanic. Now he's uncovered another great undersea mystery, the Bismarck. On the eve of World War II, the Bismarck was launched, Hitler's most powerful battleship. It was the terror of the North Atlantic, and the British Navy was desperate to sink the Bismarck. Finally, in one of the most critical battles of the war, the Bismarck went down with more than 2,000 men. Nearly 50 years later, Bob Ballard and a team of scientists set out to solve the mystery of this infamous ship lost nearly three miles below the waves. National Geographic invites you to take part in this historic undersea discovery. Join the search for Battleship Bismarck 